Good morning. This morning's scripture reading, Mark chapter 10, verses 35 through 45, follows shortly after last week's. Before we get into it, there are a few important things to note. First, in the Gospel of Mark, there are three what we called passion prediction cycles. We as readers are giving a setting. Give, Jesus makes a prediction about his impending suffering and death. There is a misunderstanding between Jesus and the disciples, and then the cycle closes with Jesus giving instruction in discipleship in light of the misunderstanding. This morning's reading is part of the third cycle. The setting is on the road to Jerusalem. Jesus knows he is walking towards his violent demise, but walks with determination because he is clear on the mission of his life and death. The disciples, as is evident by the multiple misunderstandings, are under, unclear and thus confused and afraid while on this journey. Our reading picks up right after Jesus predicts before the disciples that he will be brutally beaten, executed, and then rise from the grave three days later. The author writes, James and John, the sons of Zebedee, came forward to Jesus and said to them, Teacher, we want you to do for us whatever we ask of you. And Jesus said to them, What is it that you want me to do for you? And they said to him, Grant us to sit, one at your right hand and one at your left, in your glory. But Jesus said to them, You do not know what you are asking. Are you able to drink the cup that I drink? or be baptized with the baptism that I am baptized with? They replied, we are able. Then Jesus said to them, the cup that I drink, you will drink. And with the baptism which I am baptized, you will be baptized. But to sit at my right hand or at my left is not mine to grant, but it is for those whom it has been prepared. When the ten heard this, they began to be angry with James and John. So Jesus called them and said to them, You know that among the Gentiles, those whom they recognize as their rulers, rulers lord it over them, and their great ones are tyrants over them. But it is not so among you. But whoever wishes to become great among you must be your servant. Whoever wishes to be first among you must be slave of all. For the Son of Man came not as not to be served, but to serve, and to give his life a ransom for many. Here ends this morning's reading from the book of Mark. James and John, the sons of Zebedee, came forward to Jesus and said to him, Teacher, we want you to do for us whatever we ask of you. It's one of those funny norms in the English language, and maybe it's present in other languages too, I'm not entirely sure. Uh, But does anyone else find the question, can you do me a favor, somewhat pointless? If the person posing the question doesn't immediately follow that with a specific request, I never know how I'm supposed to answer that question without knowing what the favor is going to be. I mean, if it's to grab the bag of chips while I'm up, Sure. But if you're asking to borrow my motorcycle, I feel like that might warrant a longer discussion. And Juju, I know you're in college, but if I let you borrow it without your mom's blessing, she's going to kill me. And yet that's exactly what the disciples are doing here. Hey, Jesus, could you do James and I like a big favor? Also important to note is that pretty much this exact same question pops up earlier in this gospel. In chapter 6, remember we're in chapter 10 this morning, in chapter 6 you may call Herod throws a banquet. Verses 22 and 23 read, When the daughter of Herodias came in and danced, she pleased Herod and his guests. And the king said to the girl, Ask me for whatever you wish, and I will give it. And he solemnly swore to her, Whatever you ask me, I will give you, even half of my kingdom. Now, for those of you who are not familiar with this story, it ends with John the Baptist's head literally on a platter. So we as the reader are already sort of primed to be a bit skeptical about what it is that the disciples are about to ask for. 
Now, in this situation, I generally respond, it depends on what the favor is. Jesus opts for, what is it that you want me to do for you? And they say to him, grant us to sit one at your right hand and one at your left in your glory. It's a bold move, James and John. It's a bold move. Now, before we roast James and John for their arrogance, I do want to offer a quick aside. One of the best, if not the best, sermon I've ever heard or read in my entire life was on this very passage. It is one of the benefits of preaching the lectionary, the three-year cycle of readings appointed for worship on any given Sunday. There are quite a few other sermons that have been preached about these specific passages. The sermon is titled The Drum Major Instinct. It was preached on February 4th, 1968 by Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. At the end of it, he imagines his own funeral, which is uncomfortably prescient because as you history buffs may have already realized, that Sunday was two months to the day before he was assassinated. I strongly recommend you check it out this afternoon. Either read it, listen to it, it's super easy to find on YouTube. See, the reason the sermon is titled The Drum Major Instinct is because this passage, in certain ways, is about the drum major instinct. A desire to be out front, a desire to lead the parade, so to speak. And King rightly places us squarely in line with James and John by reminding us of our own desire to be important, to be recognized, to want that specific car, or that specific handbag, or that specific article of clothing, because as the advertisers tell us, that will make me the kind of person that I want to be. So as, as we roast James and John here, remember that we are also essentially roasting ourselves. So this request, grant us to sit one at your right hand and one at your left in your glory, is brutally ironic on multiple levels. The first is that, remember, as Pat mentioned, they are on their way to Jerusalem, and apparently under the impression that this trip will end in glory. And I mean, it it does, eventually. Uh, But what they're heading toward at this moment is the crucifixion. So there very much will be someone on Jesus' left and right, the criminals getting crucified next to him. And this is pretty much the polar opposite of glory, the way James and John are probably imagining it to be. Another level of irony uh, that, again, as Pat Pat mentioned, is this is the third go-around with this. This is the third cycle. We've already been through the get-behind-me-Satan thing with Peter in chapter 8, the teaching there being, take up your cross and follow me. We've been through the argument about who is the greatest in chapter 9, which I preached on a couple weeks ago. This results in essentially the same teaching as this morning, that whoever wants to be first must be servant of all. And yet here we are, after the third time that Jesus talks about the suffering and death that will meet him at the end of the road that they're traveling, and James and John are still over here like, so, hey, Jesus, is it cool if I like take the corner office and maybe like a parking spot? What's your C-suite looking like? I feel like I could be good in like a CHRO position, maybe like head of operations. James and John have profoundly misunderstood what the calling to be a disciple of Jesus Christ looks like. And Jesus knows this. So he lets them know in a non-confrontational way that they might be missing the point. And then he asks a clarifying question. Jesus says, you do not know what you are asking. Are you able to drink the cup that I drink or be baptized with the baptism that I am baptized with? They replied, we are able. Hmm, are you able though? When I first read this, uh, this YouTube video that I saw years ago popped into my head, and when I went to go find it, I couldn't, otherwise I'd show it to you this morning, but it's this young guy, like probably like late teens, maybe early 20s, 
uh, with his dad and some other guys, and they're out in the country skeet shooting. And I generally don't include firearm-related examples in my sermons, but this illustration is just too good to pass up. So the video starts with the son loading the shotgun, and while talking over his dad, who is giving him directions, the son is like, yeah, yeah, dad, yeah, I know what I'm doing, like, whatever. And as the guy raises the gun up, his dad, without skipping a beat, says, and remember you want to hold the butt six inches away from your shoulder. Now, for those of you who are unfamiliar, shotguns, especially old ones, have quite a bit of recoil. So when the kid fired the gun, it smoked him in the shoulder, knocked him down, and left a giant bruise both on his shoulder and probably his ego. And I feel like that's what's happening here. Jesus says, are you able to drink the cup that I drink or be baptized with the baptism that I am baptized with? And they replied, we are able. Or, yeah, yeah, Dad, like, whatever, we know what we're doing. If I was in Jesus' position, at this point I might lean more towards the Dad's style of teaching a lesson, but Jesus doesn't go that route. Then Jesus said to them, the cup that I drink, you will drink. And with the baptism with which I am baptized, you will be baptized. But to sit at my right hand or at my left is not mine to grant, but it is for those for whom it has been prepared. Jesus, surprisingly, at least to me, doesn't rebuke them, but affirms them. He says, all right, you are my disciples. We're going to do this thing. However, the baptism and cup he is referring to is probably not the baptism and cup that the disciples are thinking about. Jesus' cup is the cup of suffering. Remember in the garden, Jesus says, Mark 14, verse 36, Abba, Father, for you all things are possible. Remove this cup from me, yet not what I want, but what you want. And the baptism is of death. Our baptisms are symbolic deaths of our old selves into a new way of life. And I'll say more about that a bit later, but I want to keep moving through the story. Jesus then says, but to sit at my right hand or at my left is not mine to grant, but it is for those for whom it has been prepared. I interpret that to mean, listen, I understand you want me to give you like disciple of the year or whatever award that you want, but being a good disciple is not something that is given. It is something that is earned. You can't, a life of discipleship is not something you can get just from knowing the right person, even if that person is Jesus. A life of discipleship involves putting your money where your mouth is. And this morning's passage ends like this. When the ten heard this, they began to be angry with James and John. So Jesus called them and said to them, you know that among the Gentiles, those whom they recognize as their rulers, lord it over them. And their great ones are tyrants over them. But it is not so among you. But whoever wishes to become great among you must be your servant. And whoever wishes to be first among you must be slave of all. For the Son of Man came not to be served, but to serve, and to give his life as a ransom for many. Whoever wishes to become great among you must become your servant. Jesus is teaching them and us that discipleship is not the easy way to live in this world. And it might seem strange to hear that when in our country today, there is very little to no real risk in being Christian. In fact, it is quite easy to be Christian in our country, especially when you compare it to being Jewish or Muslim. So if Jesus is reinforcing to us that a life of discipleship will mean more trouble, difficulty, and suffering, then A, what are we doing wrong? 
since this is actually pretty easy most, most of the time? And B, how exactly is that good news? I think Lamar Williamson Jr., a professor and theologian, put it best while discussing this passage. True discipleship is characterized by a costly pouring out of one's life for another, whether that be an aging parent, a difficult spouse, a special child, another member of the Christian fellowship who has unusual needs, or any person whose situation elicits neighborly service at personal cost. Jesus came to serve and to give his life. Anyone who contemplates following, following Jesus without fear and trembling has not understood true discipleship, according to Mark. So I feel like that covers how discipleship can, in fact, be challenging in our context. But we're still left with the question, why is this good news? And I don't think we can answer this question without talking about the ideas of pastoral care and self-care. Self-care is very in vogue these days. If you haven't heard about it, it's about the individual taking time to care for their mind, body, and soul. It could be exercise, meditation, a warm bath, positive self-talk. It takes different forms for different people. And I want to be clear, self-care is very important. However, as Christians, it is incumbent upon us to be at least curious, if not critical, about what the end goal of self-care is. If the end is simply to feel better about ourselves, I don't actually see that as all that useful. Woundedness, pain, anxiety, these are things that are unavoidable. They are part of the human condition. No amount of therapy or massages or yoga is going to resolve all of my crap. Luckily for us, and here's where the good news part comes in, the function of my life as a Christian is not actually to resolve all of my crap. Our ritual of baptism enfolds us into the greater mission of Jesus Christ, which is to serve. It is, in fact, one of the greatest gifts that, as followers of Jesus Christ, the most pressing need of our lives is so much greater and more important than, well, our own lives. The call of Jesus to costly pour out our lives for others will absolutely result in pain. It, would, it will absolutely result in suffering. I would be lying if I said it didn't. And this is actually fairly predictable because the message of Jesus thrusts us into caring for others more than we care for ourselves. We shouldn't have to hunt for goodwill in the world. We are the ones who should be creating it. Now, there are some who may bring up the issue of burnout. Burnout happens when we do not adequately care for ourselves. Hence, burnout then leads to being less effective in the work of discipleship. And to address this, I'll need to share a bit of my own story. Ten years ago, I quit my job at Home Depot to start my seminary education and serve as my father's primary caregiver Monday through Friday as he had been diagnosed with early onset Alzheimer's. Serving in that role was extremely costly. It cost me time, emotional energy, lost wages, a generally positive outlook on life, and the experience of, the, the experience of living the often very self-focused life of an early 20-something, no offense. And I did burn out, badly. This was the time in my life when I went from binge drinking for fun to binge drinking because I needed an escape from the brutal reality that was my daily lived experience. And I stayed there 
for years, even after my father moved into assisted living, even after he died. And then, in the fall of 2015, I started here at Union Church. I was given responsibility. I was given obligations. I was given a job to do. And my healing started immediately. I had less time than ever, and yet I felt better than ever. I began to pour my life out into the position, into the work of the church. Better than any self-care I could do on my own, I was responding to a call to care about something that Jesus also cares about. I had been burned out not because I had too much to do. I was burned out because I was doing it wrong. Drinking, turns out, is not self-care. Some things you have to learn the hard way, I guess. Father Greg Boyle, founder of Homeboy Industries and maybe my favorite person in the world besides my wife, says that if your ministry is draining you, you are probably doing it wrong. And when we, meaning the church, focus too much on pastoral care and self-care, we are in fact doing all of you a disservice. It is not the job of the church to make you feel like you have a purpose in life. It's not the job of the church to heal your wounds. The purpose of the church is more like a field hospital. All of us, doing the costly work of discipleship, are bound to get wounded. It is the job of the church to bandage you up enough to get you back out there. The purpose of our lives is not to be fully healed. The purpose is to do the job in the field. This is what gives our lives ultimate meaning. Because the focus of our lives is outside of our own individual lives in and of themselves. Will Willimon, another fabulous professor and theologian, accurately assessed this when he said, we, we being Christians, we are being cared for by being given something, that something being a life of discipleship. We are being cared for by being given something to do that's more interesting than us or our own wounds. The life of discipleship, when done right, is extremely costly. And this, brothers and sisters, is in fact wonderful news. We don't need to focus exclusively on our own lives, our own pains, our own challenges, because we have a higher calling. To close, I want to share an anecdote from Willimon's time in parish ministry that illustrates this point. A parishioner once said to me, I'm lying in this bed, not sure if I'm gonna make it out of this alive, frightened and worried. And Jesus has the nerve to waltz in here and suggest that I ought to single-handedly fund the church's food ministry? As sick as I am, I thought, others should be looking after me, not my looking after them. And how did Jesus respond? Williman asks her. As far as I can tell, he said, I don't care. What did you think you were getting into when you were baptized? What did you think you were getting into? when you were baptized. Amen.